It was in the mid-1920s. A woman flashed across the consciousness of millions, a startling, erratic comet, successfully competing for headlines with bootleggers, flagpole sitters, the Scopes Monkey Trial. Also competing with the brilliant personalities of the sports world. The glitter of Hollywood. Valentino, Chaplin, Senate and his famous bathing beauties, and many more. She inspired the most impassioned belief, the most acid skepticism. Legally, she was Amy Semple McPherson, but to the world, she was Amy, or Sister Amy. Amy was inspirational. Amy was unpredictable. Amy was news. I'll take Jesus for mine. I'll take Jesus for mine. Oh, you can have the whole wide world. I'll take Jesus for mine. Oh, you can have the whole wide world. I'll take Jesus for mine. I come to the garden of a woman. What I'll do is sit on the rose and the voice I hear calling on my ear. The Son of God is closest, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own, and the joys I share is very there, none other has ever known. And He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own, and the joys I share is very there, none other has ever such strength tonight. The ordeal that I and my poor mother are facing. My beloved mother, whose only crime has been to love and cherish her daughter. The ordeal we must face tomorrow is nothing new. Far from it. 
what we are enduring, what each one of you is sharing with us, is part of the unending struggle, the age-old fight between the children of light and the people of darkness. Oh, it's true, speak up! The hordes of evil against the crusaders for Christ! I don't have to tell you that the enemy is powerful and unscrupulous and determined to destroy me. No, I know. Word has reached me that the district attorney said either she will have to go or we will have to go. Who will go? Yes, I know the district attorney means to do plenty to me, but I am not afraid. Let the district attorney plant his false evidence. Let him parade his pack of professional liars. Let him look back over the 17 years I have given to preaching Christ's word and let him see if he can find a flaw anywhere. Hallelujah! The mother and I are called to make a stand for the right. And such stands must be made alone as our Lord made his on the cross. Mother and I are going on trial alone as our Lord did on the cross. Mother and I want to go through it alone as our Lord did on the cross. Mother and I want to go through it alone as our Lord did on the cross. We are going down there smiling and we are coming up shining. Hallelujah! Building. Already, she's winning the first round. We have nothing to say. I represent nothing. the London Daily Mail. I am like a lamb led to the slaughter. We need much more than that, sister. Amy, could, could we get a statement? One more shot, sister. We need more Please. than that. If we. Please. Kennedy, remember me? I'm on your side. You better be, considering how much you're costing us. 
Well, ma'am, some of us work for love, and some of us work for money. Morning, Asia. The DA looks like something doesn't agree with him. <laughs> Maybe he heard Sister's sermon last night. All rise. This municipal court, city of Los Angeles, is now in session. Judge Samuel Blake presiding. The People versus McPherson. This is a preliminary hearing for this court to determine whether or not there is sufficient evidence to try the case before a jury. Mr. Kais. Your Honor, the people propose to show that Amy Simple McPherson, along with her mother, Minnie Kennedy, conspired to commit acts injurious to the public morals to prevent and obstruct justice. The people will show that Amy Simple McPherson disappeared surreptitiously from Venice, California, on or about May 18th, 1926, and reappeared on or about 2 a.m. in the morning, June 23rd, 1926, behind a slaughterhouse in Sonora, Mexico. The people will show that Amy Semple McPherson went before a grand jury, and knowing full well at the time that she had not been kidnapped, falsely and fraudulently represented and pretended that she had been kidnapped and kept in an unconscious condition for more than 30 days. The people will show that from May 19th on up to and including the 29th of May, 1926, Amy Semple McPherson resided and remained concealed with goggles and other devices and contrivances at Carmel by the Sea, from which place she departed with Kenneth G. Ormiston. With the full knowledge, acquiescence, and consent of her mother, Minnie Kennedy. And finally, we would point out to the court that as a direct result of the defendant's fake disappearance, two men lost their lives in the Pacific Ocean. We take this action against a person held so high in the religious esteem of many with regret. But the people of this community and the righteous people of all religions deserve a right to a fair and open hearing of this situation which has become a nationwide, a worldwide scandal. As our first witness, we call Emma Shackle. your left hand on the Bible, please, and raise your right. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You may sit down. Is it uh, Miss Schaffer or Mrs.? Miss. How are you employed? I'm secretary to Mrs. McPherson. You often accompany your employer on errands outside the temple? Yes. Where did you accompany her on the afternoon of May 18th? We went to Ocean Park Beach. And while Sister enjoyed the water, I looked up Bible references for her. Did you leave Mrs. McPherson alone at any time? Yes. I went to the hotel to call Mother Kennedy to tell her that Sister was unable to keep a 4.30 appointment and also to bring back some orange juice.
Mother Kennedy that Mrs. McPherson had drowned. No, I didn't. I, uh, never said that she drowned. I was afraid that's what had happened, but I never used that word. I told Mother Kennedy that Sister had disappeared in the water. When you told Mother Kennedy that her daughter had disappeared into the water, did she become hysterical? Did she go all to pieces? Mother Kennedy would never go all to pieces. She's the one who holds things together. She said, I'll have to stand up and make the best of it. And instead of asking for comfort, she tried to comfort us. Brothers and sisters here in the temple, and dear friends sitting at home beside your radios, we share a heavy burden tonight. As many of you may have heard, this afternoon while swimming at Ocean Park Beach, our beloved Amy, my cherished daughter, drowned. So far, all our desperate efforts to recover her body have failed. I know the word that's echoing in every heart. That word is why. She was such a powerful swimmer. I cannot believe she was drowned by any ordinary current or tide. I believe a blow on her head caused her death. <laughs> Often last summer, after the evening service, we would drive down to the beach and our Amy would weep at the sordid scenes, her heart breaking for those pitiful young girls. There weren't any threats. But you know, the underworld never warns before it strikes. It cannot be a coincidence that we lost Amy on the very beach she was going to preach against. Why she was taken, we do not know. How she was taken, we cannot be sure. But we do know she is with Jesus. Pray for her. <laughs> In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on. Miss Schaffer, would you say Mother Kennedy accepted her daughter's death very readily? She accepted it. What else could she do? Everything was being done to recover the body.
Mother Kennedy had a search headquarters set up on the beach. And we served coffee and sandwiches round the clock. A deep sea diver was brought in, and Mother Kennedy was there listening to his progress step by step. And yet, many people felt from the first that there was reason to believe that Mrs. McPherson was in fact alive. Oh, well, there were rumors, vicious stories made up to sell newspapers. As if Mother Kennedy hadn't enough to bear. The reporters gave her no peace. Could your daughter have slipped out of the water and chosen to disappear? She could have, but she didn't. She drowned. Have you absolutely no hope then? She may be alive. None. Mrs. Kennedy, most people in your situation would cling to the least shred of hope. Nobody's ever been in my situation before. You say you have no hope, but you've posted a $25,000 reward. To stop the rumors, calling the bluff of all the people who claim to know where Amy is. That's a generous offer. And yet we understand that Temple is in financial trouble. Another vicious rumor. Was Mrs. McPherson heavily insured? There's not one penny's worth of insurance on Amy's life. Is it true that you've heard from kidnappers who claim to be holding Mrs. McPherson? That's true. I've handed it over to the police. Is it true District Attorney Kais is considering a move into the case? Ask him. Now, is it... How many people lost their lives searching for a body that was never there? Lost their lives? Wasn't there at least two deaths directly related to the search? There was the diver from Catalina. They said he died of a ruptured appendix. And pneumonia. Induced by strenuous diving in icy waters. And there was another young man with the unlikely name of Robert Browning. I remember now. He thought he saw Sister's body and he tried to swim out. And an hour later, his body washed ashore. Can you identify this photograph? Yes. Please speak up. Who is this man? Kenneth Ormiston. <laughs> People offer this photograph of Kenneth Ormiston as Exhibit A. Where did you know Kenneth Ormiston from? He worked at the temple. In what capacity? He's a radio engineer. He installed the station for, si for Mrs. McPherson. How long was Mr. Ormiston employed by Mrs. McPherson? About a year. Maybe a little more. Did Mr. Ormiston work closely with Mrs. McPherson? He did his job. Why did Kenneth Ormiston leave the temple? He was dismissed. By whom? By Mother Kennedy. She does all the hiring and firing. Why would Mother Kennedy fire Kenneth Ormiston? You'll have to ask her. Was Kenneth Ormiston a married man? Yes. But while working with Mrs. McPherson, he was separated from his wife. For part of the time, yes. Hadn't Kenneth Ormiston's wife threatened to divorce him and name Mrs. McPherson as the other woman? Objection! <laughs> Mr. Kyes is leading the witness. Sustained. When did Mr. Ormiston leave the temple? In January of this year. Did you ever see Kenneth Ormiston at the temple after he was dismissed? In May. May, shortly before Mrs. McPherson's disappearance. Yes. Ms. Schaffer, in the temple, is there a direct telephone line from the platform to the radio station upstairs? There is. Did Mrs. McPherson often use that phone to speak with Kenneth Ormiston? When the occasion demanded.
order? No. Well, you know I don't take orders very gracefully, but... Well, this is one more exception I'm going to make in your case. Me too. Well... Mrs. Kennedy, it's been a long time. Not long enough. Visitors are not allowed in the studio. Well, being as how Kenny, Mr. Ormiston, used to work here, I figured he was an exception. There are no exceptions. And if there were, he wouldn't be one of them. What are you doing here? I came to see Charlie. Well, see Charlie on his own time and in his own place. I thought you had accepted the fact that the climate of Southern California didn't agree with you. Unfortunately, it does seem hazardous. When your employment here was terminated, we added a get well bonus to finance your search for a healthier spot. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Oh, don't you mock me. We had an understanding, a bargain. And you're not living up to your part of it. I mean to. I plan to move to the Northwest. Seattle. When? Very soon. Tonight? This is McPherson's disappearance. Did the coroner for the Los Angeles County refuse your request for a death certificate? He did. But Mother Kennedy decided to overrule the coroner and hold a gigantic memorial fundraising benefit anyway. Is that not so? There were memorial services held for Sister on Sunday, June 20th. A little while and you shall not see me. And again in a little while you shall see me because I go to the Father. Verily, verily I say, you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Yes, you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall have turned into joy. Alas, dear friends, you and I can no longer see our beloved sister, for she has gone to the Father. For the wicked of the world, it is reason to rejoice. Many of you still grieve we could not recover sister's body. I never thought we would recover her body. It was too precious to Jesus. Her pulpit chair stands empty. It will never be occupied again. In tribute to that glowing and undying presence, I know all of you are going to be S especially generous in your donations and pledges to our memorial collection tonight. Sister gave all to you, her dear, dear people. I know that each one of you will always remember that. The How much money was collected from the memorial tribute? I can't exactly recall. Wasn't it $40,000? Oh, no, 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 not that much. As I remember, um, it was about $4,500 in cash and about $30,000 in pledges. Ms. Schaffer, do you recognize this envelope? These typed pages? Yes. This is the kidnap letter from the Avengers. Have you read this letter? Yes. They claim to be holding sister and would release her if Mother Kennedy paid them $500,000.
Do you recognize this? Yes. That's a lock of hair that came with that letter. Does this letter claim this to be a lock of Mrs. McPherson's hair? Yes. Did you think it was? No. I couldn't recognize it as sister's. Miss Schaff, in this letter, aren't there answers to certain questions which Mother Kennedy posed as a test for the authenticity of the kidnappers' earlier claims? Yes. They describe a special hammock that Mother Kennedy had on her farm in Canada and her little dog, Jip. Miss Schaffer, surely this lock of hair and those accurate answers must have convinced you and Mother Kennedy that Mrs. McPherson was, in fact, alive. No. We weren't convinced. When did you give this letter to Mother Kennedy? I believe it was Monday or Tuesday. Wasn't it Saturday? No. Didn't Mother Kennedy preach her eloquent $35,000 memorial service on Sunday after she had read this letter on Saturday? No. After she had seen this very convincing evidence that Mrs. McPherson was in fact alive? That letter wasn't read until Monday or Tuesday after the service. You may step down. So help you, God? I do. Mr. Moore, you're a reporter for the Santa Barbara Press. Uh, yes. Would you tell the court what happened to you on the afternoon of May 29th of this year? Uh, well, we got a tip to the Los Angeles Times that Kenneth Ormiston was headed south from San Luis Obispo in a blue Chrysler. And there was a woman with him. Santa Barbara is halfway between San Luis Obispo and Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, late afternoon, I drove a little distance north on the coast highway and parked at an intersection. What's this all about? Uh, we've been alerted to look out for a car answering this description. Uh, you're a policeman? I'm um, working with the police, yeah. Uh, what's your name? Frank Gibson. Mm -hmm. And where are you from? I'm a hardware man from Sacramento. Who alerted you? Uh, where are you going? Los Angeles. How do you do? Look here, what's all this about? Well, uh, you're driving a car here that uh, fits the description of the machine that Kenneth Armiston and Mrs. McPherson are supposed to oh. be riding in. <laughs> My God. Well, we hate to be mistaken for those two. <laughs> yeah. Is this woman here, this lady, your wife? That's right. Now, I want to know what authority you have to be questioning us. Uh, well, no more questions. Uh, sorry to have bothered you. Have a safe trip. Mr. Moore, 
Is this the man that was driving the blue Chrysler Coupe on the afternoon of May 29th? Yes. You're positive that the man who said he was Frank Gibson was really Kenneth Ormiston. I'm sure of it. Mr. Moore, is that the woman that was with Kenneth Ormiston that night? Uh, I don't know. Mr. Moore, you were within a few feet of that woman. I'm sorry, I just can't say for sure. No more questions. I covered a revival in Fresno four years ago. So you would recognize her? I think so. I have here a copy of the Santa Barbara Press, May 30th of this year, in which your story appears. And I quote, The woman did not resemble Ms. McPherson except in General Bill. Did you write those words? Yes. As a matter of fact, when you returned to the office after interviewing that couple in the car, did you say to your city editor, the woman was not Miss McPherson? <sighs> Mr. Moore? The witness will answer the question. Yes, I said in my opinion it wasn't Amy. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to forget what little I know about arithmetic and say it was 200%. <laughs> of course, we all knew that our dear sister Emma would stand firm and unyielding, a rock of truth and sanity and love. What a shining example we have in Sister Emma's quiet, strength. But that was only part of our triumph today. After Dear Sister Emma, Mr. Kyes brought on the fearless newspaper reporter from Santa Barbara. What happened? The well-trained little parrot didn't say the words they had put into his mouth. He said, the woman was not Mrs. McPherson. In my opinion, the woman was not Amy. <laughs> Dear friends, I wish you could have seen Aza Kai's face when he heard that. His lower lip quivered and dropped to his chin. And I thought for a minute, the poor frustrated man was going to weep. And we all know, Mr. Kyes has good reason to weep, since our county supervisors have sworn out a complaint against him. Yes! Our county supervisors have charged Aza Kyes with improper use of the taxpayer's money, your money! <laughs> While he persecutes us in one courtroom, he is facing a far graver felony charge in another! <laughs> I know, I know it isn't easy, it wasn't easy for our Lord, you think it's easy for us, but I ask you to do the loving and Christian thing. Pray for the man who is trying to bring us down! Bring you down? She neglected to mention that I indicted the supervisors first. We still have a strong case, I think. Day by day, we can put it together in the courtroom. Not after night, she can tear it apart at the temple. Do you have any?
any idea how many people heard her just now? 200,000, 300,000, half a million. Most of them don't take her seriously. We'll have our day. Tomorrow. Jim Klein, you are now chief of detectives of the Los Angeles Police Department. 17 years, sir, since 1909. When Mrs. McPherson disappeared on May 18th of this year, did you take a personal interest in the case? I did. I put myself on 24-hour duty out at the beach. Isn't that rather unusual, Captain? Well, this is a rather unusual case, sir. <laughs> I believe Mrs. McPherson had drowned, but I wanted to make sure every lead was traced through. Why were you convinced the lady had drowned? Well, sir, what were the other possibilities? Suicide. There was no known motive. And besides, why would a woman bother to change into a bathing suit to drown herself? Murder. When she was last seen, she was in the water. There was nobody near her. A lapse of memory. Well, if a woman in a green bathing suit came out of the water and wandered off, how far do you think she'd get without being seen? And kidnapping. Well, sir, how could the kidnappers spirit the lady out of the water past her secretary? You dismissed the possibility of kidnap, but weren't there ransom notes from alleged kidnappers? Oh, a lot of them. And we followed them all through, but they were mostly from cranks. Seemed like half the population of California wanted to be part of the show. <laughs> In your investigation, was any attempt made to locate Kenneth Ormiston? Well, we certainly did. We had witnesses who saw him at Angelus Temple the week before Mrs. McPherson disappeared. Then three days after her disappearance, he was at the State Motor Vehicle Department in San Francisco. I was considering an all-out search for him when nine days after she disappeared, he strolled into search headquarters without so much as a buyer leave. Mother Kennedy? I understand you're looking for me. Why? Why, Kenneth, what a surprise. Captain Klein, this is Mr. Ormiston. Well, how do you do, sir? Captain Klein is investigating sister's disappearance. I am glad you decided to come in. I read in a newspaper up in San Francisco I was wanted for questioning. I caught the first train south. Ah, oh, that's fine, that's fine. Now, would you please take a seat? Thank you. No. Were you on the beach? With Mrs. McPherson the day she disappeared? No, of course I wasn't. No, of course not. And when was the last time that you seen her then? At the temple, a couple of days before. Ah. I spoke with Mother Kennedy then too. And your relationship with Mrs. Uh, McPherson? Then? I admired and respected her. And the insinuations in the paper are an insult to her memory. Oh, yes, indeed. You've been traveling around under lots of different names, mister. Well, my wife's threatened to make adultery the basis of a divorce suit. In this state, Captain, adultery is a statutory crime. A man could end up in prison. Or a woman. Does your wife intend to charge Mrs. McPherson in this action? Oh, no. I don't think even Ruth's that desperate. I'm the one she wants to punish. Mm -hmm. However, in the face of what Mother Kennedy's going through, my problems seem very unimportant. The people who knew Mrs. McPherson, all they have left is a memory of her, and I simply won't let the newspapers use me to disfigure and malign that memory. So you found Kenneth Ormiston very cooperative. Oh, he cooperated beautifully for about an hour on May 27th. He has not been seen since. 
Captain, what was the next major development in your investigation? Oh, it didn't do much. Except check out phony leads until the morning of June 23rd. I was awakened by a phone call from the chief of police of Douglas, Arizona. I went immediately to the Temple residence to report to Mother Kennedy. He's sure that it's Mrs. McPherson. Where is Douglas, Arizona? Oh, it's in the uh, southeast corner of the state, on the border of Mexico. As a matter of fact, apparently the kidnappers have been holding her in Mexico. I don't believe it. Well, it is quite a ways from Ocean Park Beach. She escaped from the kidnappers? And ended up in a dead faint in some Mexican's yard in a little nowhere place called the Agua Prieta. Can I call her? She uh, is going to call you here at 7.30. Uh, it, it's an hour later over there. Oh, there have been so many false alarms. The one from Coos Bay, another one from Montreal. Yes, but this time the authorities are quite sure that it's the real Mackay. But I can't blame you for being skeptical. I mean, you get your hopes up and then they're dashed to the ground. It is you. Are you all right? Yes, they're taking good care of me here at the hospital. But Mother, it's been a nightmare. All I want is to come home to go on with my work. Don't talk. I'm coming there. And until I get there, you just rest and relax. Mother? Don't talk. Could she have been taken without being seen? Amy never listened to strangers. Are you all right, Mrs.? All right. It's just that after accepting her death, Delivering her memorial service. To hear her voice. Oh, what's this? A ransom letter. When did you receive this letter, Mrs.? Yesterday. And why didn't you notify me then? I was going to call you this morning. Did you accompany Mrs. Kennedy to Douglas, Arizona? I did. And a Mr. Joseph Ryan, a deputy from your own office, went along with us. Mother. Mother? Sister. Sister. Mother. <laughs> oh. Mother, who are these gentlemen? Uh, of course. This is Mr. Ryan of the district attorney's office and Captain Klein, chief of detectives from Los Angeles. Oh, and, uh, this young man is a stenographer that we've borrowed from the U.S. Cavalry. <laughs> hey, why don't you sit over there, Corporal? Uh, Captain Klein? Uh, Mrs. McPherson. Uh, uh, they burned me when they were trying to get information out of me. Mr. Ryan, it's very good of you to come this way. Uh, you're looking very well, Mrs. McPherson. I'm feeling much stronger, but I still tire so easily. 
Mr. Ryan, you must not question sister now. No, mother. These gentlemen have come 500 miles to see me. Even brought a stenographer with them. I can't disappoint them. Won't you sit down? Uh, thank, you. thank you. But may I ask you if I may go through my story from start to finish without stopping? Oh, that'll be fine, Mrs. I'll have time for all the questions later. <clears throat> And please, I hope you'll be patient with me because I won't be able to give you exact times and dates. Because I was blindfolded and gagged, kept locked up. It seems so long ago. I was in the water. Emma... Well, Miss Shepherd, my secretary, was on the beach working on my sermon notes. I swam out past the pier, and as I came back, the tide carried me a little way beyond where Emma sat on the beach. As I waded out, I heard a voice say, Mrs. McPherson? It was a woman I had never seen before. She had black hair and brown eyes. She was... I would say she weighed in the vicinity of 180 pounds. And she was plainly dressed. Now, you tell me if I go too fast. And there was a man with her. He was clean-shaven, heavy-set, with a clear complexion and brown hair. Oh, Mrs. McPherson, the woman said, my baby's dying. Won't you please come and pray for my baby? She said the baby was in an automobile parked by the bathhouse. I asked them how they had managed to find me. They told me they had gone to the temple and talked to you, Mother, and you had told them that I was at the beach and that you were sure I would be glad to pray for the baby. That sounded so much like you, Mother, that I had to believe them. The woman had a long black coat over her arm, and she put it around my shoulders. As we came close to the bathhouse, she ran on ahead to a sedan that was parked by the curb. There was another man at the driver's wheel, and the woman climbed in the back seat, huddled far into the corner with a bundle in her laps. I thought it was the baby. I stepped my foot onto the running board, behind me and pushed me headlong into the into the back seat of the car there was a blanket thrown over me and something pressed to my face a sickly smell sister are you sure you should try this yes yes i'm sure when i came to the woman was standing over me I was lying on an old iron bed, vomiting severely. It seemed to be dawn. A terrible room, one window, uh, almost boarded up to the top. The light came from a kerosene lamp. I could make out a table, a chair, a dresser. You had no idea where you were? N Later, I heard them speak of Calexico. When the woman saw that I was awake, she called Steve, and the man who had pushed me into the car came in. He told me that I was being held for ransom. They wanted me to write a letter, and they said they were asking $500,000 in ransom. Five hundred thousand dollars. I told them it just couldn't be raised. You've got a million, Steve said. Then they began to question me. They asked me about our hammock in Canada. I told them it was a wire one stretched between two apple trees. They wanted me to describe our dog. Then they asked me to describe our dining room stove. 
And then they ask for a description of Wallace. I wouldn't give them those descriptions. That's when they began to torture me. One of them grabbed me, and Steve took my hand and burned it, the lit cigar. I told him to go ahead and burn it. I never moved my hand. Finally, when they saw they couldn't frighten me, they stopped. Finally, Rose, that was the woman's name, gave me an old dress to wear, much too large. One night, I was blindfolded and taken outside. They threw me into the back of an auto, bound and gagged, and we began to drive. They put a blanket over me so I couldn't see where we were going. I heard another machine following us. Finally, the auto stopped. They took me into an old adobe shack, dirty, with one poor room. They put down soldiers' cots for us to lie on. Rosie slept on the cot next to mine. Two days later, Steve came back and demanded again that I write a letter to you. When I refused, they cut off two locks of hair from my head. And if that doesn't convince her, we'll cut off your finger and we'll send that to her. The next Tuesday was the first time that I was alone. It was when Rosie went for supplies. I begged her not to, not to gag me again, and she promised that she wouldn't. She bound my wrists with a, a flat strap, and she put me on the cot. She left. As I lay on the cot, I saw in the corner of the room a tin can with a jagged edge. It was the kind we used to put maple syrup in, in Canada. I managed to get off the cot and crawl over to where the can was, and by working and pulling the straps against the jagged edge of the can, I managed to pull myself free and break the straps. I was free. I prayed for help, and it came. I managed to go to the window. I fell from the outside. It wasn't much of a drop. And then I started running. I ran and ran. From the position of the sun, I would say that it, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. It was hot. I stumbled on and on. And I fell many, many times. Night descended on me. But I was afraid to sleep. But many times I dropped from sheer exhaustion. Blisters came on my feet, and the pain was terrible. After a long, long while, I came to a little shack with a tin roof. And I went to the door and I called. It was empty. I stumbled on and on until finally I saw a glow in the sky. It looked like heaven. A town. A village at last. I went closer, I saw a shadow, and then as I came even nearer, I saw that it was a building. A slaughterhouse. A man came out, attracted by the barking of his dogs. He was dressed in his BVDs. <laughs> I asked him for help, but he didn't seem to understand, so I went on. I stumbled on and on, until finally, finally, I saw a house with a light. I called out! And then I'm afraid I fainted. Those kind Mexican people notified the authorities. And they brought me back over the border. And here I am. That's an incredible story, Mrs. McPherson. Thank God. It's over. Now, there's just a few questions. Oh. Detectives and Excuse reporters... Me. Oh, no, Joseph. Mrs. McPherson. 
there have been persistent rumors about your relationship with Kenneth Ormiston. Witnesses claim that they saw you with him in Salinas, in San Luis Obispo, riding with him in a blue Chrysler coupe near Santa Barbara. Now, all this, supposedly, during the time you were missing. Mr. Ryan, since I was bound hand and foot in a Mexican desert, I obviously wasn't joyriding with Mr. Ormiston in Santa Barbara or anywhere else. Mrs. McPherson, the fact is, Kenneth Ormiston does own a blue Chrysler coupe. In fact, he purchased it with a money order in Seattle signed by a James Wallace. Now, the only James Wallace we could turn up was your half-brother. Who has been dead for 15 years. You're treating me like a criminal instead of the victim. Now, please, Mrs. McPherson, we're only doing what we have to. Why? What was my crime? I tried to help a woman who said her baby was dying. Gentlemen, I'll have to ask you to leave now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. I didn't intend to upset you. I'm not... I'm not myself yet. Mr. Ryan, I promised the local police that I would go with them to try to locate the shack this afternoon. So, I'd really better rest. May we talk later? Thank you. Nurse, you may go. I will look after Sister. Mother, if you don't mind, I really would like to rest. It's a joy seeing you, but also a strain. Very well. I'll check into the hotel. Then I'll be back. Most experienced trackers in the southwest. Fine tooth comb the entire area. No adobe shack with a wooden floor could be found. Did you accompany Mrs. McPherson on her own personal search? I did, on three separate occasions. She could not lead you to it. She didn't seem to recognize anything. Well, she was real confident and high-spirited at first. But when I took her and Mother Kennedy back to their hotel that last time, it was obvious to me Mrs. McPherson was very discouraged. Amy? Don't start at me, Mother. I want the truth. You've heard it. So far, I haven't heard one word I believe. Where were you? Oh. You're not walking out on me without an explanation. You owe me that much after what I've been through. After what you've been through? Disappearing like that and leaving me to face the music? I've been through hell these past five weeks. And it's your fault. If you think you can stroll back into my life as though nothing had happened, think again. I want the whole truth, and I want it right now. Right, let's call in the newspaper people, too. Oh, you have done enough damage there already. I warned you not to talk. To anyone but you. Oh, Amy. Amy, how can I protect you if I don't know? I'll protect myself. By making up more of these fairy tales? Oh, wake up, Amy. Who do you think you're fooling? Certainly not me or half of those reporters down there. I think most people will believe me, as most people always have. Those who don't, well, I'll just have to get along without them. Don't threaten me, Missy. No threat, Mother. Believe or get out. That's a choice. But 
if I am to defend you? To defend me, all you have to remember is that from this moment on, everything you do or say is based on the simple fact that I am telling the truth. Mother, I don't want to lose you. I need all the help I can get. But I can't have you with me if you're doubting me, questioning, weakening me. All right. You know I won't abandon you. And if you tell me I have to believe, then I have to believe. But the, the reporters won't be so easily managed. They smell a big story. I've given them a big story. They smell a bigger one. Didn't you see them talking to the Mexicans? The man who owned most of the land that you claim to have walked over? Well, 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 don't you think he would know this shack? And at the hospital, questioning the nurses, why weren't you more, well, more exhausted, dehydrated, sunburned? They seem to believe me. Seem. They're setting you up, Amy, to pull you down. Well, let them try. Let them. My people will believe me. I'll win. I will. Despair, knowing this moment would come when we would be together again. Please, everyone sit. Home. Home again. The Lord has brought me home. I could stand here for hours just looking into these dear, familiar faces. How many times in the 39 terrible days of my testing, I thought I would never be here again, never see my beloved brothers and sisters again. Like Daniel, we will still be betrayed by false witnesses. Daniel was saved from the lion's den, but not from the lying tongues. Dear, dear brothers and sisters. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Brothers and sisters, my kidnapping and the vicious scandals that circulated while I was away from you, all of this all of this is a plot, 
a plot hatched by the devil not to extort $500,000, but to wreck this temple. Oh, no. yes. The Prince of Lies used a lie about a little child to lure your shepherd away. Then the wolves rushed in with more lies to frighten and scatter the flock, but the sheep were not scandalized. Your courage, your faith, your love have delivered your sister from the lions. And from the lying, I am delivered. heard the defendant tell her story of her kidnap and escape, what was your reaction? I didn't believe it. She didn't convince you she had been kidnapped? She did not. Mrs. McPherson had not been kidnapped. Where did she go on May 18th, the day she disappeared from Ocean Park Beach? She went to Carmel, California with Kenneth G. Ormiston. Objection! Your Honor, the Deputy District Attorney is presenting his personal fantasy as fact. Mr. Gilbert, we will document Mr. Ryan's statements. Overruled. Mr. Ryan, what first led you to believe that Mrs. McPherson might have spent part of the five weeks she was missing in Carmel, California? On July 23rd, the Monterey Chief of Police called our office. He said he had convincing evidence that Mrs. McPherson had spent 10 days in Carmel. I went up to investigate his story. And what did you find? On May 14th, a man calling himself George McIntyre rented a bungalow on Scenic Drive. He said that his wife was recuperating from a recent illness and that she needed quiet and seclusion. They would move in late on the 18th of May or early on the 19th. I showed the real estate agent and the owner of the bungalow a photograph of Kenneth Ormiston. They immediately identified it as the man calling himself George McIntyre. Is this the house? Yes, sir, it is. Did they move in on May 18th, the day Mrs. McPherson disappeared from Ocean Park Beach? Actually, it was uh, 4 a.m. the morning of May 19th, sir. How long did the McIntyre stay at the house on Scenic Drive? Ten days. From the 19th of May to the 29th of May. Yes, sir. And the 29th of May was the day that Kenneth Ormiston and a mysterious woman were seen fleeing south through Santa Barbara. Apart from eyewitnesses, was there any other evidence that you found that might have convinced you that Mrs. McIntyre was Mrs. McPherson? Yes, sir. There was a small notepad hanging by the back door on which Mrs. McPherson... <laughs> Mrs. McIntyre left her daily orders for groceries to be delivered. In the grass nearby, I found two of those crumpled grocery lists. Did you compare the handwriting on those grocery lists with Mrs. McPherson's? Yes, sir, I did. And subsequently, experts held them to be undeniably the same. Then why are those grocery lists not introduced as evidence here today? Well, sir, they were presented, along with other evidence, to the grand jury. Yes. And as you know, sir, uh, Mrs. McPherson testified before the grand jury some months ago. Mrs. McPherson, I have now heard you tell your story a number of times. Lately, we've spent a lot of time together, Mr. Ryan. Each time, I've noticed it sounds almost word for word the same, as if it were, in fact, memorized. The truth doesn't vary. When Mother Kennedy rushed into your arms in that hospital room, there was a quick exchange of whispers. Did that have anything to do with the kidnapping? Yes, sir. I'll tell you exactly what mother said. The same question I guess any mother would ask her daughter at such a moment. Mother said, my dear, did they molest you in any way? And I said, 
No, thank God. No, Mother, they didn't. Mrs. McPherson. Mrs. McPherson. What was the relationship between you and your mother just prior to your disappearance? The same as they always were. Deepest love and affection. Did you and she see eye to eye on the subject of Kenneth Ormerson? Yes, sir, we did. Thank you. Mr. Kyes, may I be permitted to speak directly to the grand jury for just a moment? Yes, you may. My dear mother gave me to God before I was born. My very earliest training was in the Bible. Would you believe that when I was five years old, I lined up chairs and preached to them? I was converted at 17, and I fell in love with the evangelist who converted me. I married him and sailed with him to China, never expecting to return to my beloved country again, but willing to give my life for Jesus. I buried my precious husband in that faraway land. And I came back home with my little baby in my arms. She was born just one month after we lost her daddy. As soon as I was able, I began preaching again. To poor people, simple people. I saved a few dollars from the first collection and I bought a little tent. It was full of holes, but it was mine, all mine. Well, people began to hear that I had a gift, a gift of faith, and they came and I shared it. It wasn't long before I was preaching to as many as 16,000 people in one day. Now, when honest, dedicated people like you ask to investigate my story, I'm not afraid because my story is true. But do you know what does frighten me? I'm afraid. I'm afraid that those who are not my friends will seize the chance to destroy a dream. A dream that started when I was five years old and preached to those empty chairs. If there's any doubt in your minds, please, please call me. Talk with me. Let me try to answer your questions. And pray for your sister as she will surely pray for you. After Mrs. McPherson left, the grand jury took a 10-minute recess. During that period, I saw Mrs. Holmes, one of the jurors, examining the evidence, including, of course, the grocery slips. Then she excused herself, and she went to the ladies' room. When I went over, just to reassure myself, the grocery slips were gone. Did you make an extensive search of the room in the drawers? Yes, sir, I did. But I knew it was a waste of time. Those slips were on their way to El Segundo, the municipal sewage disposal plant. <laughs> Mr. Ryan, how did you come to be on this case? I was assigned to it by the district attorney's office, Mr. Gilbert, according to the usual procedure. Mm-hmm. Strange coincidence that the chief investigator, Captain Klein, just so happens to be your father-in-law. 
father-in-law did not request my assignment, Mr. Gilbert. We never even discussed the case until the trip to Douglas, Arizona. Didn't you brag that you were going to Douglas to break Ms. McPherson? Absolutely not. I went to Douglas with an open mind. And when did you shut it? When I discovered that Kenneth G. Ormiston was in Carmel. Thank you, that's all. When I examined those grocery slips and I compared the handwriting. Ryan. When I returned from Carmel, Ryan. I knew that Amy Sinclair McPherson was a hypocrite and a fake. Right. And you are a hypocrite and a liar! Dear brothers and sisters, the time has come for a showdown. A showdown not before officials and officialdom, but before the great American public. I will reveal a chain of evidence that will make this whole damnable conspiracy clear to every man, woman, and child in the world. Who is it who is so determined to assassinate the character of a defenseless woman? Who? District Attorney Asa Kais working through his two unscrupulous, vindictive, and biased agents, Herman Klein and Joseph Ryan. Before Klein went to Douglas, Arizona, he stated publicly and repeatedly his belief that I had drowned. In Douglas, he stated equally positively his belief that I had been kidnapped. What could possibly be their motivation? What? It's very simple, my dear friends, all too simple. Both Herman Klein and Joseph Ryan are Catholics persecuting a Protestant minister! <laughs> Mr. Benedict, there is no doubt in your mind that the man who rented your bungalow in Carmel was Kenneth Ormiston. No, no doubt whatsoever. When did the McIntyres take occupancy? It was very early in the morning on May 19th. May 19th? The day after Mrs. McPherson disappeared from Ocean Park Beach? May 19th. Mr. Benedict, did you ever see the woman? Only once, the second or third day after they moved in. I was attending to some roses, and when I was working in the yard, McIntyre came out. Well, good morning, Mr. Benedict. Hi. Don't mean to bother you folks, but I had to get these roses in the ground right away. Oh, it's good to see you. Don't worry, I'm not going to be one of those live-in landlords. How does your missus like the house? Oh, she just loves it. Dear, come on out here and say hello to Mr. Benedict. He's working with these rose bushes. Come on out here. Well, welcome to Carmel, Mrs. McIntyre. <coughs> Y'all been to the beach yet? Yeah, she's still not feeling so good. Well, a couple of weeks of this good Carmel air, and I'm sure she'll be feeling a lot better. Mr. Benedict, was that woman in Carmel, Mrs. McPherson, She was very similar. But is this the woman that you knew as Mrs. McIntyre? I won't name Mrs. McPherson. <laughs> Mr. Benedict, are you sure? Yes, I wouldn't have been able to recognize my own sister in that getup. <laughs> No further questions. Your witness. Your Honor, the defense has no questions for Mr. Benedict at this time. The witness is excused. The court will now adjourn for lunch. Excuse me. Perhaps you're already aware of this. If not, I feel obligated to inform you. Kenneth Ormiston has just surrendered and voluntarily agreed to testify this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Pines. After weeks and weeks of lies and evasions in this courtroom, perhaps we'll finally hear the truth. Shall we have lunch? Uh -huh.
district attorney. After so many months, why should he decide to come and, and, and testify? He must have made a deal. Maybe he's tired of running. Maybe he's buying some peace and quiet by telling the truth. What is the truth? Don't turn your back on me. What's left of my life is very important to me. And I do not want to spend any part of it in a place like this. Don't worry, Mother. I'd never let them send you to prison. I know what prison's like. But what is that supposed to mean? Amy, I insist you tell me if you were with Ormiston. Why won't you tell me? Because I want one thing in my life that I can call my own. Something that isn't the Lord's, that isn't the temple, that isn't my people's, and that isn't yours. You've always had me convinced that the one worst thing I could ever do, the one unforgivable sin, was to keep a secret from you. Isn't that right, Mother? But, Mother, everybody's entitled to some little something of their own. Something she doesn't have to share with anyone else. Hasn't every person on earth the right to that much? When you became a minister of the gospel, you surrendered that right. I may have surrendered once. With arms? No, Mom. With you. The day I was born your daughter. Since you've come back, you're a different person. You always confided in me. We, we've always shared everything. Everything is too much to ask. We are in this together. I have a right to know. Were you with Armisen? Answer me. Were you with Armisen? The people call Kenneth Ormiston. Kenneth Ormiston! Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. State your full name, please. Kenneth G. Ormiston. Your occupation? I'm a radio engineer, but at the moment I'm unemployed. Did you at one time work for Amy Semple McPherson? 
Yes, sir, I installed the station in the temple for Mrs. McPherson. When did you leave her employ? January. For what reason? It's personal. Between you and Mrs. McPherson? My wife was impossibly jealous of the lady. On May 14th of this year, did you rent a cottage in Carmel, California? I did, under the name George McIntyre. When did you take occupancy? Early the morning of May 19th. Were you alone? No, sir. There was a lady with me. A woman you introduced to the owner of the cottage is Mrs. McIntyre. That's correct. That lady who shared the cottage in Carmel with you for approximately 10 days late in May, was she not in fact Amy Simple McPherson? No, she was not. <laughs> Sir, you are under an oath. I am aware of that. I want it on the record, once and for all, that Mrs. McPherson was in no way connected with the so-called love nest in Carmel. <laughs> No more questions at this time. Your Honor, the defense has no need to cross-examine Mr. Ormiston at this time. Your Honor, the people would like to request a brief recess. Very well. Ten minutes. The witness may step down. After scrupulous analysis of the testimony presented in court here today, it is my carefully considered opinion that this case should be... that this case can no longer be tried with honor, nor with little hope of success. We have come to believe that Mrs. McPherson will be tried in the only court of her jurisdiction, the court of public opinion. Therefore, the people request that all charges be dropped against Kenneth Ormiston, Minnie Kennedy, and Amy Semple McPherson. Our reaction has been identical to yours, Mr. Kais. Therefore, your request is granted. All charges dismissed.
Next Tuesday on Channel 4, Richard Chamberlain stars in a